All right, so in 1 Samuel chapter 5, of course, if you recall last week, uh, we read the story where the Ark of God had actually been taken out in battle by the Israelites. And it came to pass that when the Philistines saw the Ark of God, that they began to cry out for fear. And, and they actually ended up winning that battle and taking the Ark with them into their land. So the Ark went into the hands of the enemy. And of course, we recall the story how uh, Eli heard the news about his sons dying and the ark being taken. His grandchild was born and named Ichabod for the glory of the Lord had departed. And that's kind of where we left off last week. So we're going to pick it up here in 1 Samuel chapter 5. And I thought, um, you know, I thought about maybe starting to subtitle some of these, um, these sermons on, on Thursday nights, kind of give us a theme about maybe what's in this chapter. And really what we see in this is a lot of stubbornness and a lot of superstition on the part of the Philistines. And now if you look there in verse 1, it says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. Now if you recall in the story so far, Samuel, the child, has been established as a prophet of the Lord. And we talked about how people had become encouraged by that fact, and they were probably thinking that things were on the up and up, they were, things were looking up, and maybe they got a little overconfident, and they'd gone out into this battle rather than doing what they should have done, which has got their own hearts right with God and taken opportunity of that. But what we see here is that even though there was a man of God established, even though God was beginning to move there, bad things had taken place. The Philistines took the Ark of God. They brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. They had taken this away. And what we can understand from this is that your life you know, is never going to be perfect. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be difficulties. There's always going to be trials, even when things are looking good, even though they were looking and saying, wow, Samuel's here, there's a new, uh, the word of the Lord is established, things are going to be good, you know, and they were in time once they got their heart right and things like that. What I want us to understand right out of the gate, just a quick point is the fact that, you know, your life's never going to be perfect, you know, not necessarily just because of sin in your life or anything like that, although sin will do that in your life, but just because of the fact that that's the way life works, you know, once we kind of get one area of our life fixed and nailed down, it seems like there's another problem that pops up and we have to deal with with that. So things are never going to be perfect. And I really don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I thought that was kind of something worth pointing out. You know, everything was going good for them when Samuel showed up and came on the scene and everyone's excited about that, you know, but then this happens. The Ark of God disappears. There's always seems to be a trouble, trouble in life. And boy, that's the truth, you know, especially in ministries. It just seems like it's just one battle after another. It's just one fight after another. Once things seem to be going, going good and things are you know, picking up speed and everything's going great, you know, some conflict, some drama, something pops up, we get that resolved, maybe go for a little while without one, then another one comes along, and that's just life. There's always going to be another storm, another battle, another trial, another problem, another situation in life that we have to work through. You know, your, our, our optimal circumstances are often not optional. You know, optimal circumstances are not often optional. It's not very often in life where everything's just perfect. Everything's optimal. You know, it's usually not an option at all. Now, if you look there in verse 2, it says, When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ark, to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Now, right out of the gate, this should show you what, how, how much of esteem they really even hold this God Dagon in. You know, the Lord God of Israel said, I, I will not share my glory with another. You know, he wasn't, you weren't going to take some false god into the tabernacle and set it up next to the ark. It's just not going to happen. He's not going to allow that. And, they, and you know, the Israelites wouldn't even think to do that because all the times God said that they would have no other gods before him. That was one of the, you know, that's the commandment, you know, that they're not to do that. But here the Philistines, they have no problem just bringing God's ark in and just setting it right up next to their other god. And just saying, hey, we'll just have, we'll get a little collection going. <laughs> you know, they're probably the type of people that have the coexist bumper sticker on their car, right? We'll just add another religion to all these other religions, and everyone can just get along. All these different gods are basically the same thing. But we see from the story that's not the case. And God said, I will not share my glory with another. He goes on there and says, after they'd set him up in verse 2, look at verse 3, it says, And when they hey, when they have Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they walk in in the morning, and this false god, this idol Dagon that they had set up, is just face down on the ground. 
And it says that they, uh, in verse 4, uh, they, they beheld him in the morning, uh, fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And uh, Excuse me, not there. Uh, verse 3. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. So they walk in, they see Dagon on the floor, they go, oh, that's weird. Well, must have been a little earthquake last night. You know, okay, who shoved Dagon? You know, who, who came in here and, and pushed Dagon over? You know, who did it? And they just set Dagon back up and they think nothing of it. And really what this is, is a shot across the bow from God. This is God saying, hey, you, better, you might want to rethink about what you're doing with the ark there. You might want to rethink about just adding me to your other gods. <coughs> so, but they just set them up. You know, they don't get it. You know, they're clueless here. They just go, they just persist. What are they? They're, they're stubborn. They're not getting the message, right? They're not getting the fact that, hey, God's not going to let you just do things, uh, whatever, however you feel. God's not just going to let you add him to another a part of your religion. So he goes on in verse 4, And when they rose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, except this time, you know, God's done a little surgery. It says, Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. So you got to kind of read that there, what he's saying by when it's cut off upon the threshold. I imagine that what it, the Bible is saying is that, you know, he didn't not only just cut off their hand, the hand and hands, but he actually put them on the threshold of the door. When they actually came to the house, they saw the, his head and they saw his two hands just sitting right there in the doorway. So they'd have to walk up, oh, excuse me, Dagon, you know, and get in there and try to fix things. You know, God's letting them know, hey, before you even get in here, I've already, you know, I've, I've been busy. You know, I've been working while you were sleeping last night. <coughs> and it says, only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Now, so you can see, uh, the, we're going to get into the stubbornness, but here's where kind of their superstition starts to come in. They're very superstitious people. He says, therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. Now, if you were one of these people, and, you, and, and twice now, this, and two nights in a row, you found your false god knocked over, and in the second morning, he's cut, he's cut up, his head's cut off, his palms are cut off, and they're set down on the, in the doorway, on the threshold. You know, are you just going to just go about your business? I mean, you're probably going to, any reasonable person would stop and go, what's going on here? You know, there's something's not right. Maybe we should stop and rethink our position about Dagon and the Lord. Maybe we should reconsider who is the Lord God, who is the only true and living God. It might not be Dagon because we keep finding Dagon, you know, in these precarious uh, positions, right? We keep finding him face down. But that's not what these people did. They're superstitious and they're stubborn. What they did is they go, oh, poor Dagon. Well, let's just not step on the threshold. You know, quick, go get the, get the, get the wood glue and the, and the C-clamps, right? And let's, let's put Dagon back together again, like Humpty Dumpty. You know, and they're, they're in there trying to fix Dagon. So instead of getting right with God, instead of just throwing out the stump with the rest of them, you know, like the, the, like the lame end of a muffin, <laughs> the stump that nobody really wants to eat, but they do anyway, you know, they, they probably should have just said, wait a minute, you know, there's something wrong here. You know, and then the, you can see this, they're, but they're stubborn. They're stubborn people, and that leads to them becoming very superstitious about things. They don't step on the threshold, you know, don't step on the crack or you'll break your mother's back kind of a thing. Right, don't step on the threshold or you're going to make Dagon mad because that's where his head and hands were one, night, one morning. <coughs> so rather than acknowledging their error, rather than saying, wait a minute, you know, there's something wrong here. Ever since we brought the Ark of the Lord in here, you know, Dagon been, hasn't been doing so hot. They, instead of acknowledging that, they just do what? They dig in their heels. You know, they say, well, it certainly can't be because D Dagon's a false god. It certainly can't be because Dagon is, is not the true and living God. That's not what's going on here. They dig in their heels, and, and how do they do it? By becoming superstitious. And it, or, or it leads to them becoming superstitious. So now they're saying, well, let's not step on the, the threshold. <coughs> now, the, rash, the rational reaction, and if you would, go over to Judges chapter 16. Keep something there in 1 Samuel 5, of course, but go to Judges chapter 16. The... the, the, the the reasonable reaction, the rational person would have seen what was going on there and forsaken Dagon. 
they would have they would have said, well, you know, I've been worshiping worshiping this Dagon guy, but ever since the Ark's been here, you know, he's been getting knocked over. What kind of a god just lets himself get knocked over? <coughs> you know, it reminds me of what uh, Gideon's dad told the worshippers of Baal when they wanted to kill Gideon. He said, you know, let you know, if Baal be a god, let him let him fight for himself. You know, who would stand up for Baal? He's saying, look, if he's such a great god, let him defend himself. Not these guys, though. Not these Philistines. They're, they're just, they just keep right on going because they're stubborn and they're superstitious. The rational person would say, well, you know what? Dagon must not be the real God and gone to worship the true and living God. And what this shows us is that some people will never learn. Some people are just so stubborn that they're just never going to learn. And it, you know this proves true when you start to think about who Dagon was and the Philistines' relationship to Dagon. This isn't the first time Dagon has shown up in Scripture. <coughs> it says here, if you would uh, look at Judges chapter 16, verse 23. This is, of course, the story of Samson, right? We understand. And this is before Samuel's day. This is, this is previous to what we're reading in 1 Samuel 5. When Samson, you know, that mighty man of God, that judge, that judged Israel, had finally, you know, flirted with sin long enough to where the, the, the Philistines found out a secret through Delilah. They cut off his hair. They put out his eyes. They, you know, they bind him and they bring him down to, the, the, to, the, to, to, to grind in the wheelhouse, right? And of course, one day, uh, they all get the lords of the Philistines together and they want to make sport. Of, of Samson. They want to bring him out and mock him because Samson had, you know, done him, done him dirty plenty. So they'd kind of been going back and forth with Samson. So it says there in verse 23, it says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered themselves together for, uh, to offer uh, a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god. So Dagon's got history with the Philistines. This has been, you know, their god. You know, the, the, the Philistines in Sam, Sam, Samuel's day, you'd ask them, you know, you go to church anywhere? Like, yeah, I go to Dagon's. You know, I go to the house of Dagon. That's where my dad went, my grandpa went, my grandma went, my great-grandparents went there. You know, like when you knock on the door of a, just one of those dyed-in-the-wool Catholics who just, you know, they go to the Catholic church because that's where mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, they're buried in the, in the churchyard there. And that's just, you know, where I went and that's where I'm going to go. And I'm, I'm just, I'm Catholic bred and when I die, I'll be Catholic dead. That's just their mentality. And that's the same mentality that the Dagons have, or excuse me, the Philistines have regarding Dagon. And what is that mentality? It's stubbornness of not being able to admit, hey, this is wrong. What we believe is wrong. We should change what we believe and believe what's right. This is just part of human nature. Some people suffer from it more than others. So all the way back here, we see them. They're offering a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God hath delivered Samson, un, uh, our enemy, into our hand. Now, is that really what happened? No. They used, Sam, it was actually Samson's sin that led him to this position. But they're giving glory to, you know, to their God, uh, Dagon, their false God. For they said, uh, our God hath delivered, uh, us, uh, delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts with Mary, they said, call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between, two, between the pillars. And Samson said uh, unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may pray, that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Remember that 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 car we saw out there, the the AC company. It was called what was it, Samson Brothers or whatever. And they had this picture of Samson. This was their company logo, Samson, like this. You know, with like pushing. It was like red and blue, like it was an AC. You know, it was a HVAC company, heating and ventilation and air conditioning. And I'm like, what a dumb logo to have for your company. You know, you have you have you have Samson committing suicide. That's that's your logo. Like I, it just goes to show you, people don't really uh, even they just have these ideas about the Bible. Like, oh, that looks cool, Samson between the pillars. Yeah, that's Samson killing himself after he's been severely judged by God. Anyway, that's just something that came to mind. I remember we were out soul winning last Sunday and we saw this car, this company vehicle that that was their logo, Samson killing himself. I thought you get a kick out of it. But it says in verse 26, And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there, and that, uh, excuse me, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women and that beheld Samson while he made sport. 
And Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord, God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may avenge once for the Philistine of my, for my two eyes. And of course, we know the story. He, he, he took hold of the two middle pillars which where the house stood and upon which it was born. And he, and he goes ahead and he, and he says, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house uh, fell upon the Lord's and upon all that were slain, uh, people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And you say, what are you getting at tonight? Well, remember what brought all these people together in the first place. Why were they there? Why were there all these people up on the roof making sport of Samson? Well, verse 23. They had gathered together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they were giving, for they said, our God hath delivered Samson. So they're there praising Dagon. But look what happens. And you would think after that happened, they'd go, hmm, about this Dagon guy. You know, what, what's really going on with Dagon? Is this really true? But we see them all these years later, still worshiping Dagon in Samuel's day. And then continuing to worship him, even though, you know, you know, I remember, where were you when Samson pushed the two pillars down, right? I remember where I was, you know. <laughs> I remember the day that Samson pushed the pillars down and, and 3,000 people died, right? <clears throat> All those generations later, you know, people who've had, who someone's grandpa died at the hand of Samson, who was there worshiping Dagon, you know, now they're here in Ashdod and they see Dagon falling down twice and then the second time, you know, he's got his head and his hands in the doorway, but we're still just going to keep right on worshiping Dagon. Because that's just the way we do it. That's just who we are. We're not going to change. No, they're a bunch of stubborn Philistines. That's what they are. They're stubborn people. And they're superstitious. Oh, well, Dagon, you know, he, he, just, yeah, he was having a bad day that day. You know, normally he, would, well, he could handle the Lord no problem. And, you know, I'm sure there was a reason, you know, maybe Dagon was just upset. That's why he let, you know, somebody, you know, stepped on a crack somewhere or, or you know, picked a four-leaf clover or something and Dagon was upset. You know, they, they have some superstitious reason as why Dagon let them suffer at the hand of Samson. They're stubborn and they're superstitious people. <coughs> and then we see that because they're still worshiping this false god despite Samson destroying the Philistines. They continue to worship this false god in Samuel's day. And here's the thing, you know, People who persist, like these Philistines, like these stubborn Philistines, people who persist in, in holding on to a failing position, you know, they're not to be commended for their stubbornness in whatever, whatever way it is. Whether it's you know, the unsaved person at the door who just refuses to, to, to change what they believe about the Bible, about God, and get saved. No one's going to walk from that. Well, you know, I just really commend the fact that they're just, you know, they're just a bulwark in their in their false false way. Sure, God admire the fact that they're just, you know, thick headed and, and stubborn. They're not going to change. At least they're consistent. You know, that's nothing to praise in somebody. Whether it's the lost or whether it's people holding to some false doctrine or involved in some false religion. You know, we should never praise people for their stubbornness. I mean, look at what it leads to. It leads to superstition. It leads to suffering. <clears throat> go to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. You know, stubbornness is a very serious sin in the Bible. It's not something, you know, we, especially among men, you know, men like to kind of be, you know, considered, you know, bullheaded. You know, they like to think, well, I'm just not going to change. You know, this is just, this is the way my daddy was, when my grandpa was, and, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. You know, I'm Irish. That's why I'm so angry. I just can't change. You no, know, you're stubborn is what the problem is. You're hard-hearted, you're stiff-necked, and you're stubborn. And you can't just admit you're wrong and change. And that's nothing to be praised. It's nothing to be admired. You know what's more respectable is a person who could admit they're wrong and change. I have more, I, you know, I almost have more respect for a person like that than a person who's, right, right, who's correct right out of the gate. The person who's just got it right right away. That's, I mean, that's great. That's what we would, I, that's the ideal. But what about the guy who's, it's almost more commendable for a guy to be shown, oh, I'm wrong about something and now let me change. Because it shows he's not stubborn. He's not stiff-necked. He's not like these Philistines here who are just worshiping this false god, just going along with it generation after generation despite all the judgment that's coming down on them <coughs> because of their stubbornness. 
And I'll remind us of the seriousness of, you know, we just went through Deuteronomy, and I've, I feel like I'm going back to this verse about every other midweek service, but in Deuteronomy 21 it says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, by the way, those are two things that go together, being stubborn and rebellious. You know, because people who are, who are stubborn, you know, they're not going to change do, to do right. They refuse to get right. It makes them a rebel. If a man have a stubborn, rebellious son, remember that, that passage? Everyone remember that? Where he says, uh, The parent shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn, rebellious. He's a glutton and a drunkard. You know, he wouldn't take heed to us. It says, All the men of the city shall stone him with stones, that he die. And that's, you know, that God does not take stubbornness lightly. It's a very serious sin. We should not, stubbornness should not be part of who we are. You know, we shouldn't have be stubborn people in any way, shape, or form. You know, we should always be willing to be open to correction. We should always be willing to change your mind. You know, this is something that, uh, you know, preachers can, can fall prey to. You know, it, to, they're, they're afraid to get up and preach something and then find out they're, they're, when they're proven wrong to just admit that they're wrong. And enjoy crow and just eat some crow and just say, you know what, I'm, I was wrong. And I was listening to a preacher lately who, who preached something that corrected something I had preached. I'm not going to tell you what it was. <laughs> I can't even remember exactly what it was. Some, was. some about Samson, about how Samson, uh, I always had it in my mind that Samson should not have you know, touched the carcass of the lion. I'd, I've even preached that, you know, if you remember that sermon, nothing in his hand, I talked about how it was sin for Samson to go and take the, the jawbone of an ass. Now, I think there's a lot more to that story than, than some people give it credit for. But I heard this preacher say, you know, I don't agree with that. I don't think, you know, I could see where people are coming from, but I don't agree that, you know, him touching the lion or him touching the jawbone of an ass was a sin. And then he, go, he goes to Numbers, I believe it's, uh, I can't remember where it is in Numbers, where it talks about the vow of the Nazarene and how the, he shall come at no, at, at no dead body. But then it goes on to specifically say he should not defile himself for his mother or his father or his kinfolk. Like it's talking about the fact that you wouldn't go near, you know, like to a funeral or touch a human dead body. And I said, you know what? I said to myself, well, you know, I just believe that that, you know, I don't care what the scripture says. I don't care what the context is. You know, I preached it already and the people heard it and I'm sure they were paying attention that day. Right? And I'm not going to get up and correct myself in front of my whole congregation and admit that I was wrong about something I preached. Why? Because I'm stubborn. And I'm rebellious against the truth of God's Word. That's what it is. But you know what? I was wrong. And that's a very minor thing to be wrong about. But we have to admit, you know, preachers from the, from the pulpit to the pew, everybody's going to be wrong about something. Is there anybody in this room that would say, oh, I'm never wrong about anything? You know what? You're wrong about that. Everybody's wrong about something at some point in their life. Some of us more often than others. <laughs> right? But, you know, that's to err is human. Right? But, you know, to be the, the, the admirable thing is to admit when you're wrong. And to not be a stubborn person. Because stubborn people don't succeed. They're, they're their own worst enemy. I mean, isn't that the Philistines' problem here? When they're just digging in their heels, I'm going to keep worshiping Dagon, I'm going to keep worshiping Dagon. And all these bad things. And it, believe me, we're just getting into the story. Things get pretty bad if you were listening. What goes on with these, these folks. You're there in Judges chapter 2. Look at verse 19. You know, some people just never want to learn. They cannot be taught. <coughs> it says here in Judges 2 verse 19, It came to pass when the judge was dead. It's talking about the cycle that Israel had gone through. God would raise up a deliverer. They would get right with God. And then when the judge died that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. Kind of like the Philistines, serving false gods, right? They cease not from their own doings and from their stubborn way. <coughs> you know, your stubborn way is just your own doing. Maybe your own way of doing things is just your stubborn way, you know, like these people. Well, that's just the way I do things. Well, you should do it differently. No, that's just the way I do it. Well, no, that's just what I believe. That's just what I teach. Well, you're wrong. Well, that's just the way I do it. Well, you're wrong. Well, that's just the way I do it. Well, now you're stubborn. <clears throat> Some people never learn. They just, you know, insist on, on, on continuing going on, being stubborn, and they be even become more superstitious, like we saw with the Philistines, right, in verse 4, where they were... You know, they come, there, they come the second morning and the head and the hands are there 
instead of going, well, I guess Dagon isn't all that in a bag of chips after all. You know, maybe we should get, forsake this false god. Instead, they say, well, oh, wow, baby, well, here, let's just not step on the threshold. Uh, Dagon's trying to tell us something. You know, he doesn't want us to step on this threshold. They become more superstitious. Instead of admitting they're wrong, they just become more superstitious. <clears throat> you can go back to First, uh, first Samuel chapter 5. You know, and people that refuse to be corrected, people that refuse to admit that they're wrong, people who are just going to be stubborn and pig-headed and digging their heels, they're going to become superstitious. But here's the thing. They're going to get judged. God doesn't just let us go along our merry way when we're, when we're in, in sin or in error or preaching or teaching something we shouldn't or believing in something that we shouldn't. When we've been shown, we've been corrected, when we've been admonished multiple times and we're just going to dig in our heels, God's going to judge those people. Those people will be judged to some degree or another. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 1, a very familiar verse, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. He that's being often reproved, just constantly told, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you need to change, you need to change, you need to change, and he just stiffens his neck. He hardeneth his neck. And I've preached it before, but it's that picture of, you know, when you're hardening your neck, you're reeling back. When somebody's wrong, they often drop their head. And people who don't have the humility to do that, they harden their neck. And they, they lift up, they get that proud look, right? <coughs> but those people, they're going to be suddenly destroyed in that without remedy. God's going to judge in some way, shape, or form. Now look there in verse 6, it says, But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them. So, you know, just setting, just, you know, not stepping on the, uh, the, the threshold wasn't enough. That wasn't what God was trying to get across to them. You know, they, they persist in their stubbornness, right? And it says that God, the hand of God was heavy upon them. Look, they're going to be judged. When you're stubborn and digging your heels, God judges. Because God, you know, wants to, cor God corrects people all the time. Go read Hebrews 12. You know, he chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. But it says here that the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them, and smote them with emeralds. Now you say, what's an emerald? Well, we could speculate, but you know, based upon verse 9, where it says it was in their secret parts, which is the lap area, which is the part of the body that we don't talk about, right? We all know what we're talking about. Uh, you know, that's the part of the area that was being affected. So whatever an emerald is, you know, just based on its location, it doesn't sound like anything you want, <laughs> right? Probably add an H and an I in there after, you know, and you probably could figure out what it is. <clears throat> so it says that's, you know, God smote them with emeralds. That's, that's pretty severe. Even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So he just judges this whole city. And when the men of Ashdod saw it, that it was so, they said, the ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us. Oh, they're getting it. They're finally getting it. That it's the ark of God's the problem. That they, they, need to, they need to do something with the ark. You think they still got the right answer? No, why? Because they're stubborn people. Instead of coming to the right conclusion, what do they do? For his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. And so they're still clinging to Dagon. <laughs> they, you think they were getting it, right? What does it say in verse 8? They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? The answer is obvious to us. Return the ark. Send it back. Isn't that pretty much the obvious? Isn't it? We all figured that out probably the first time we read the story. Oh, Ashdod got smote with Israel. I bet I'm about to read how they're going to send it back. How they learned their lesson, they got humbled, and they sent the ark back to where it came from. Because it doesn't, you have to be that intelligent to figure out, oh, no ark, no emeralds. We have an ark, we have emeralds. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Is that what these people did though? Is that, did they come to that conclusion? The most obvious answer no. <laughs> they answered, let the ark of God be carried <laughs> unto Gath. Just take it to the next town over. Let them deal with it. And they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither. They just got it out of there. Look, if they couldn't figure out this answer, you know what they are? They're not only, they're not only stubborn, they're stupid. They're ignorant people. That is such a logical conclusion to come to. Just send the ark back. 
They can't figure it out. Why? Because when you're, when you're stubborn, you become ignorant. You dig in and you, and you, and refuse to, you, don't, you don't see the logical conclusion. And here's the thing, you know, ignorance can be forgiven. You know, you can forgive somebody for just not knowing about something and then teaching them something or showing them something. Like the Philistines could have, you know, you could almost say, oh, well, you know, they were unsaved heathen, they're worshiping Dagon, the ark comes. But they figured it out once God judged them and he, his hand was heavy upon them. And then they sent the ark back and, you know, they were just ignorant. They had to figure it out. But that's not what they did. They're more than just ignorant. They're stupid, to put it in modern terms. They're brute beasts. They're dumb. You know, and ignorance can be forgiven, but here's the thing. You just can't fix stupid. You probably heard that saying, right? You can't fix stupid. Some people just want to get to the place where they just want to be dumb. And you can't fix them. They just want to be dumb and stay dumb, and that's the way they're going to be. <coughs> the answer is obvious here. Return the ark. No. Just take it to the next city. We're not going to give it back to the, back to the Israelites. We're just not going to do it. Because then we'd have to admit that, you know, their God is better than our God. They were right and we were wrong and we just can't have that. But these guys, I mean, you know, I guess they, you know, Dagon didn't teach them love thy neighbor as thyself, right? He didn't teach them that. Do unto others that you have to do unto you. That was the, their false God must not have taught that. I don't know what the teachings of Dagon but based up, were, but based upon the story, I don't think that was one of the commandments that Dagon taught. Because here they are just passing the buck. What are we going to do with this, man? We're getting smoked with emeralds and the, we're being destroyed. The Lord of God, his hand is heavy upon us. What are we going to do? I'm going to just take it next door. Take it over to, where'd they take it there? Take it over to Gath. You know where uh, the, 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 the Philistine of Gath, Goliath, came from? Another Philistine? Let's take it over to neighbors. I got family over there. Hey, I got some in-laws over there. You <laughs> should take it over there, right? I'd love to see them have to put up with this for a while. All right? Talk about passing the buck. You know what you can learn from this? Is that stubborn people harm those around them. That's why stubborn is something, is something, you, have, is something you have to take seriously. Because stubborn people who dig in their heels, all they do is end up harming everybody around them. They care more about just being right, and they just care more about, you know, digging in their heels and just not admitting they're wrong than they do about the people around them. Oh, just take it over there. Let them deal with it. See if they get emeralds too. They can join us in our misery. <coughs> Look at verse 9. And it was so that after they had carried about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. And they had emeralds in their secret parts. So sure enough, they got them too. So you think, okay, surely by now, two different cities, Ashdod, now Gath, these people have got to have gotten it. They must have gotten the message that everywhere the ark goes, this judgment follows. And they're like, you would think the next words you're about to read are, and then the Philistines came to their senses and snapped out of their delusion and sent it back and just admitted that they were wrong. Is that what happens in the story though? No. We'll read on. It says... <laughs> It says in verse 10, Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. They're just like, we'll send it to the next city, to the third city. You see how stubborn people just harm everybody around them? How they just bring everybody down. They just join us in being judged by God through our stubbornness. <clears throat> and it came to pass as the ark of God came to Akron, the Akronites cried out, saying, so words at least got into the Akronites, and at least these guys have enough sense to cry out against it. You're like, whoa, we already heard about what went on in Ashdod. We've already heard about what went on in Gath. You know, the Emirates? What? No, we don't want anything to do with that. Take that somewhere else. It says they cried out saying, they have brought about the ark of God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. They're saying, look, you're coming, you're bringing the ark, you're judging us. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go down to its place. That it slay us not. So they're, you know, finally somebody is kind of like getting it. <coughs> and, not, and our people, for there was a deadly destruction throughout the, all the city. So God's already judging this city. And the hand of God was heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with the emeralds. So now not only getting these emeralds, now men are just dying. Now they're just being destroyed. God's just straight up just killing people now. 
and the cry of the city went up to heaven. <coughs> and that's kind of an interesting phrase there at the end. I really don't have time to get into that. Um, but what I want to kind of close is just showing us that, you know, the judgment of God was proportional to the stubbornness of the people, if you notice that. I mean, you think about it. God, first they bring in the ark of, uh, of God from Israel, right? And they set it up in their temple. And God just pushes Dagon over. Like, hey, that's not where the ark belongs. You should probably send that back. Let me just, dink, knock your little God over. Oh, put the God back up. Must, I don't know what that was. You know, must have been this or that. And then God goes, no, knock it off. I'm going to cut his little head off and cut his little hands and put him in your little door. You getting the message? You getting what I'm, you're seeing what I'm, what I'm showing you here? No. Oh, don't step on the threshold. You know, just put him back up. Somebody, let's, let's put Ashdod back together. Keep the ark here. God's like, all right, how about some emeralds? How about that? You think they got it then? Nope. Next city, more emeralds. More destruction. Third city, God's like, oh, I don't know what else to do. Let me just start killing you. When are you going to get the message that God, you know, when are you going to get it through your thick head that you're wrong and just get right? How, much, how long is God going to have to sit there and judge these people before they just admit they're wrong. Wouldn't it have been easier? What, I mean, think of all the, 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 the emeralds that people wouldn't have gotten, all the people that'd still be alive in that land. If the first time God knocked them over, they just went, let's send it, whoa, let's just get this thing out of here. I mean, at least the first one, you know, where, where he just knocks Ashtot, uh, 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 Dagon over. I mean, you could kind of see how they might just think, well, that's kind of weird. Uh, maybe it was an earthquake, you know, or somebody snuck in here. I mean, you could kind of forgive that. But when the head's cut off and the hands are cut off and they're set in the door, that's when you should probably start to think about things. <coughs> but they just dig in their heels. Just can't admit they're wrong. They start harming everybody around them. And the more stubborn they become and ignorant that they become, the more God just starts judging them even harder. To the point where the hand of God is heavy in Akron. And men are dying and suffering. You know what else I thought was interesting about this? It only talks about men getting this. Now, I, I don't, I, maybe it means man, like in the sense of mankind, but I think he was specifically just afflicting the men. <laughs> and what I think that shows us is that God, because men are leaders, you know, despite what the world would have you to believe, you know, men are to lead the home, men are to be the leaders in their families and, and in society. They're the ones that God has given that strength to and God has, you know, ordained to be that leader. You know, and that's another sermon. But here's the thing. What that shows us is that God holds leaders accountable. That you as a leader don't have the privilege of just being stubborn. And that when you as a leader are a stubborn person, you're going to affect everybody else. You're going to harm other people. You know, stubborn dads are going to harm their families. Dads that just refuse to get right with God, that just want to dig in their heels, just keep, you know, persisting in some sin, or just not, you know, maybe not even, maybe it's not the bad, some bad thing they're doing. Maybe it's just not, they don't want to do the right thing. Just like, well, you know, church is good for you, if you honey, if you want to go, but I'm just, I'm just not going to go. You take the kids and you haul them all down there and, and you go through all that and I'm just going to stay home today because church just isn't for me. And all these churches, they're saying, you know what you are? You're stubborn. You're a stubborn man, and you're harming your family. That's the way that works. God holds leaders accountable. I believe that's why he afflicted the men. He's showing us that. <coughs> and if you would, we're going to just turn to a couple more places, and we'll be done tonight. Go over to 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Because, you know, I think I've illustrated how stubborn these Philistines are. But you know what? They're, I'm just going to take it to the next level and show you how stubborn they really are. Because these stubborn, superstitious Philistines never learn their lesson. You would think after everything they went through, after all the times their false god let them down and got them into trouble, you know, when Samson's knocking down pillars and killing thousands of people while they're worshiping their false god, and then years later... When they're bringing in the ark, God's you know, knocking over their idol and smiting everybody, all these men with emeralds and killing people. You'd think, they, you'd think somebody would finally come to the light and say, Dagon's a false god. The Lord God of Israel, he is the Lord. They would convert. You would think that, right? 
But, you know, it wasn't, you know, you know, if you recall the story of Samuel, he's the one who ordains Saul as king. So even in just, you know, a little bit further into the story, they're still worshiping Dagon. Look there in First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 6. So Saul died, right? The first king of Israel that Samuel ordained, he ends up dying at the end of his life. So this isn't very far removed from the story we're reading about in 1 Samuel 5. And all his house died together, and there were all the men of Israel that were in the valley saw that they fled, and Saul and his sons were dead. They all, and then they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And when they had stripped him and took off his head and his armor, they sent into the land of the Philistines round about to carrying unto their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. Even after everything these guys went through with worshiping this false god, they still have a temple to this false god. <clears throat> despite Dagon failing them in Samson's day, despite him bringing the heavy hand of God upon them in Samuel's day, we find these Philistines still worshiping Dagon. And you know what? It makes it real clear that he's a false god there, that he's an idol. That's what Dagon is. You know what? And we in our lives, you know, we're, we're, we probably might think we're free and clear because we don't have some false god in our house. You know, we don't have some, some idol set up, physical idol. Although many people do in this country. You know, there are a lot of Hindus, especially in the Phoenix area, that they, I've been in their homes, you know, doing work and seen little rooms, you know, where they have an idol with pictures and flowers and they literally worship idols. This happens. But I doubt that's anybody in the room tonight. At least it better not be. Right, First Corinthians 5, you out. Right. But here's the thing. We might not have that, <coughs> but we have something, we have the potential to be something far, the, the far worth, worse than an idolater. You know what that is? Stubborn. You say, how is that worse? Well, go over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter, fi chapter 15. You know, we might not be some heathen Philistine worshiping some false god. But you know what? We might just be just as stubborn as they were. And you say, well, what's the, why, why should that matter? Because God judged them. You know, and <laughs> we're going to, you think we're going to escape the judgment of God if we're just as stubborn as they are? He says in verse 23 of 1 Samuel chapter 15, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now, idolatry is a pretty severe sin. I mean, witchcraft? That's pretty heavy. If you were involved in these sins, I mean, something's seriously wrong in your life. If you're worshiping a false god, if you're you know, practicing divin uh, divin uh, divination and, and things like that. But the Bible says rebellion is the same way. It's just as wicked. It says stubbornness is, is just the same as, as iniquity and idolatry. Well, I don't have a... I, Dagon's not set up my house. I got, you know, I worship the Lord. Yeah, but are you stubborn? But you have a hard time admitting when you're wrong? You have a hard time receiving correction? You have a hard time doing what you're told? Well, you know what? You're stubborn. You might as well set up an idol and, and name it, well, this is stubborn. This is my idol, stubborn. You know, I, I pull him a, a bowl of cereal every morning and I leave it there. And he never eats it. But I keep feeding him because I'm stubborn, just like him. <coughs> you know, here's, and here's the application for you tonight. Don't waste your time on stubborn people. Don't waste your time on them. Because you can't fix stupid. You can't fix people that are just going to dig in their heels and remain ignorant and not change. <coughs> the Bible says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. You know, when someone's a fool and they're just not going to change, you're just going to continue on just being a stubborn person, don't waste your time on them. You know, we can apply that out soul winning. You know, don't sit there and, and just waste your time talking to people that are just going to, just, they just want to contend with you. They just want to put up a fight. They just want to argue. They just want to get you some conversation. And the Bible says a wise man will hear and will increase learning. That's who you want to talk to. You know, rebuke a wise man and he will love thee, the Bible says. Because he's not stubborn. He's going to say, thank you for the correction. Thank you. you. know, you must love me. You must care about me enough to tell me when I'm wrong. You know, open rebuke is better than secret love, the Bible says. It's better to, to, to hear the rebuke of the wise than the song of fools. 
You know, a wise man will hear and he will increase learning. He's not going to, you know, a wise man's not going to hear and go, well, just, I'm not going to change. Well, that's just the way we are. That's just, I've always believed that. I'm never going to change. I've believed that for 20 years. Great, congratulations, you've been wrong for 20 years. How about just changing? <coughs> so, and here's the last thing to apply. Don't be a stubborn person yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to just pick on stubborn people and say, well, don't waste your time on them. They're this, they're that. But we should all examine our own hearts. Because I bet if we looked hard enough, we might just find that we have a little bit of stubbornness even in our own hearts in some way. <coughs> Maybe not to the degree of we're going to be so dumb as to keep false gods when, when we're just being <laughs> judged by God. But I bet it's there if, we are, if we're being honest. So, you know, ignorance, stubbornness, these are for things that belong unto the heathen. And they should not be attributes that are shared by God's people. All right, let's pray.